Chapter Five, Part One: A Famous American Statesman by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Andrew Jackson, Part One. George Bancroft said, "No man in private life so possessed the hearts of all around him. No public man of the country ever returned to private life." with such an abiding mastery over the affections of the people. He was as sincere a man as ever lived. He was wholly, always, and altogether sincere and true. Up to the last he dared do anything that it was right to do. He united personal courage and moral courage beyond any man of whom history keeps the record. Jackson never was vanquished. He was always fortunate. He conquered the wilderness. He conquered the savage. He conquered the veterans of the battlefield of Europe. He conquered everywhere in statesmanship, and when death came to get the mastery over him, he turned that last enemy aside as tranquilly as he had done the feeblest of his adversaries, and passed from earth in the triumphant consciousness of immortality. Thus wrote Bancroft of the man who rose from poverty and sorrow to receive the highest gift which the American nation can bestow. The gift did not come through chance. It came because the man was worthy of it, and had earned the love and honor of the people. In 1765, among other immigrants, a man, with his wife and two sons, came to the New World from the north of Ireland. They were linen weavers, poor but industrious, and members of the Presbyterian Church. They settled at Waxhaw, North Carolina, not far from the South Carolina boundary, and the husband began to build a log house for his dear ones. This man was the father of Andrew Jackson. Scarcely had the log house been built and a single crop raised before the wife was left a widow and the children fatherless. There was a quiet funeral, a half dozen friends standing around an open grave, and then the little house passed into other hands, and Mrs. Jackson went to live at the home of her brother-in-law. Not long after the funeral, a third son was born, March 15, 1767, whom the stricken mother named Andrew Jackson after his father. He was welcomed in tears and naturally became the idol of her young heart. Three weeks later, she moved to the house of another brother-in-law to assist in his family. She was not afraid to work, and she bent herself to the hard labor of pioneer life. There was no sorrow in the labor, for was she not doing it for her sons? And a noble woman knows no hardship in her self-sacrifice for love. Her ambition seems to have centered in the slight, light-haired, blue-eyed Andrew, who, she hoped, one day might become a Presbyterian minister. How he was to obtain a college education, perhaps, she did not discern, but she trusted, and trust is a divine thing. The barefooted boy attended a school kept by Dr. Waddle. He made commendable progress in his studies, from his quick and ardent temperament, but he loved fun even better than books. He was impulsive, ambitious, and persevering. He could run foot races as rapidly as the bigger boys, and loved to wrestle or engage in anything which seemed like a battle. Says an old schoolmate, I could throw him three times out of four, but he would never stay throwed. He was dead game even then, and never would give up. To the younger boys he was a protector, but from the older he would brook no insult, and was sometimes hasty and overbearing. One of the best traits in the boy's character was his love for his mother. His intense nature knew no change, and he was loyal and single of purpose forever. He used to say in later life, One of the last injunctions given me by my mother was never to insinuate a suit for assault and battery or for defamation, never to wound the feelings of others nor suffer my own to be outraged. These were her words of admonition to me. I remember them well and have never failed to respect them. My settled course through life has been to bear them in mind, and never to insult or wantonly to assail the feelings of any one, and yet many conceive me to be a most ferocious animal, insensible to moral duty, and regardless of the laws both of God and man. He did nothing slowly or indifferently. He bent his will to his work, even at that early age, and knew no such word as failure. When the boy was thirteen, an incident occurred which made a lasting impression. The British General Tarleton, in the Revolutionary War, with 300 cavalry, came against Waxhaw, surprised the militia, killing 113 and wounding 150. The little settlement was terrorized. 
The meeting house became a hospital, and Mrs. Jackson, with her sons, helped to minister to the wants of the suffering soldiers. Andrew learned not only lessons in war, but to dream of future rewards to the British. When Cornwallis, after the surrender of General Gates, moved his whole army toward Waxhaw, Mrs. Jackson and her sons were obliged to seek a safe retreat with a distant relative. Here Andrew did chores for his board. Never, said one who knew him well at this time, did Andrew come home from the shops without bringing with him some new weapon with which to kill the enemy. Sometimes it was a rude spear, which he would forge while waiting for a blacksmith to finish his job. Sometimes it was a club or a tomahawk. Once he fashioned the blade of a scythe to a pole, and on reaching home began to cut down the weeds with it that grew around the house, assailing them with extreme fury and occasionally uttering words like these, Oh, if I were a man, how I would sweep down the British with my grass blade. A year later, when Mrs. Jackson had returned to Waxhaw, the brothers were both taken prisoners in a skirmish. Being commanded to clean the boots of a British officer, Andrew refused, saying, Sir, I am a prisoner of war, and claim to be treated as such. The angry Englishman drew his sword and rushed at the boy, who, attempting to defend himself from the blow, received a deep gash in his left hand, and also on his head, the scars of which he bore through life. Robert, the brother, also refused to clean the boots, and was prostrated by the sword of the brutal officer. Soon after, the boys were taken with other prisoners to Camden, eighty miles distant, a long and agonizing journey for wounded men. They found the prison a wretched place, with no medical supplies, the food scanty, and smallpox raging among the inmates. The poor mother, hearing of their forlorn condition, hastened to the place. Both her boys were ill of the dreaded smallpox, and both suffering from their sword wounds. She arranged for the exchange of prisoners, and took her sons home. Robert to die in her arms two days later, and Andrew to be saved at last after a perilous illness of several months. Her oldest son Hugh had already given his life to his country in the war. Almost broken-hearted with the loss of her two sons, yet intensely patriotic, she hastened to the Charleston prison ships to care for the wounded, taking with her provisions and medicines sent by loving wives and daughters. The blessed ministrations proved of short duration. Mrs. Jackson was taken ill of ship fever, died after a short illness, and was buried in the open plain nearby. The grave is unmarked and unknown. When, years later, her illustrious son had become president, he tried to find the burial place of the woman he idolized, but it was impossible. Andrew was now an orphan and poor, but he had what makes any boy or man rich, the memory of a devoted heroic mother. Such a person has an inspiration that is like martial music on the field of battle. He is urged onward to duty forevermore. The world is richer for all such instances of ideal womanhood, the womanhood that gives rather than receives, that seeks neither admiration nor self-aggrandizement, that, like the flowers, sends out the same fragrance, whether in royal gardens or beside the peasant's door, that lives to lighten others' sorrows, to rest tired humanity, to sweeten the bitterness of life by her loveliness of soul, that is to the world around her a new and certain sunrise every day. Fatherless, motherless, brotherless, the boy of fifteen looked about him to see what his life work should be. In the family of a distant relative he found a home. The son was a saddler. For six months Andrew worked at this trade, but other plans were in his mind. He knew how his mother had desired that he might be educated. But how could a boy win his way without money? For two years or more little is known of him. It is believed that he taught a small school. When nearly eighteen he had made up his mind to study law, a somewhat remarkable decision for a boy in his circumstances. If he studied at all, it should be under the best of teachers, so he rode to Salisbury, seventy-five miles from Waxhaw, and entered the office of Mr. Spruce McKay, an eminent lawyer, and later a judge of distinction. For nearly two years he studied, enjoying also the sports of the time, and making, as he did all through life, close friends who were devoted to his interests. When in the White House, forty-five years afterward, he said, I was but a raw lad then, but I did my best and he did his best through life. He loved a fine horse almost as though it were human. 
he enjoyed the society of ladies and possessed a grace and dignity of manner that surprised those who knew the hardships of his life his eager intelligence his quick direct glance that bespoke alertness of mind won him attention even more than the beauty of person over six feet in height slender to delicacy he gave the impression of leadership from his bravery and self-reliance emerson well says the basis of good manners is self-reliance self-trust is the first secret of success the belief that if you are here the authorities of the universe put you here and for cause or with such task strictly appointed you in your constitution when his two years of law study were ended the work was but just begun there was reputation to be made and perhaps a fortune but where and how for a year he seems not to have found a law opening the streams of fortune do not always flow toward us we have to make the journey by persistent and hard rowing against the tide he probably worked in a store owned by some acquaintances earning for daily needs at twenty-one came his first opportunity came as it often comes through a friend mr john mcnary was appointed a judge of the superior court of the western district of north carolina tennessee and young jackson his friend public prosecutor of the same district he moved to nashville in seventeen eighty eight to begin his difficult work he was obliged to ride on horseback over the mountains and through the wilderness often among hostile indians his life almost constantly in danger once while traveling with a party of emigrants when all slept save the sentinels he sat against a tree smoking his corn-cob pipe and keeping an eager watch soon he heard the notes of what seemed to be various owls he quietly roused the whole party and moved them on an hour later a company of hunters lay down by the fires which jackson had left and before daylight all save one man were killed by the indians sometimes the young lawyer slept for twenty successive nights in the wilderness this was no life of ease and luxury at nashville he found lodgings in the house of the widow of colonel john donelson a brave pioneer from virginia who had been killed by the indians and here jackson met the woman who was to prove his good angel as long as she lived with mrs donelson lived her dark-haired and dark-eyed daughter rachel married to lewis robards from kentucky vivacious kindly and sympathetic rachel had been the idol of her father and probably would have been of her husband had it not been for his jealous disposition he became angry at jackson as he had been at others and made her life so unhappy that she separated from him and went to friends in natchez with the approval of her mother and the entire confidence and respect of her husband's relatives after a divorce in seventeen ninety one jackson married her when they were each twenty-four years old history does not record a happier marriage to the last she lived for him alone but not more fully than he lived for her with the world he was thought to be domineering and harsh and was often profane but with her he was patient gentle and deferential when he won a renown she was happy for his sake but she did not care for it for herself her kindness of heart took her among the sick and the unfortunate and everywhere she was a welcome comforter she lived outside of self and found her reward in the homage of her husband and her friends jackson soon began to prosper financially often he would receive his fee in lands a square mile of six hundred and forty acres or more so that after a time he was the possessor of several thousand acres success came also from other sources when a convention was called to form a constitution for the new state of tennessee jackson was chosen a delegate he took an active part in the organization of the state he was active in whatever he engaged and bravely espoused her claims against the general government for expenses incurred in indian conflicts tennessee felt that she had a true friend in jackson and when she wanted a man to represent her in congress she sent him to the house of representatives this honor came at twenty-nine years of age a strange contrast to the years when he made saddles or did chores for his board and longed to sweep down the british with his grass blade jackson served his state well by securing compensation for every man who had done service or lost his property in the indian wars it was not strange therefore that when a vacancy occurred in the united states senate jackson was chosen to fill the place in the autumn of seventeen ninety seven only thirty years old 
Rachel Jackson might well be proud of him. But the following year he resigned his position, glad to be, as he supposed, out of official life. He was, however, too prominent to be allowed to remain in private life, and was elected to a judgeship of the Supreme Court of Tennessee. As he had made it a rule never to seek and never to decline public duty, he accepted, on the small salary of six hundred dollars a year. While many other men in the state were more learned in the law than Jackson, yet the people believed in his honesty and integrity, and therefore he was chosen. Quick to decide, and slow to change his mind, in fifteen days he had disposed of fifty cases, says James Parton, in his entertaining life of Andrew Jackson. After six years, longing for a more active life, Jackson resigned, and was made Major General of the Militia of the State. This position was given, not without opposition, he receiving only one more vote than his chief competitor. That one vote, perhaps, led to New Orleans and the Presidency. This office was in accordance with his natural tastes. Since boyhood he had loved the stir and command of battle, and believed he should like to conquer an enemy as he had met and conquered every obstacle that lay athwart his path. As there was no war in progress, he continued his law practice. But, not satisfied with this alone, he became a merchant, trading with the Indians, selling blankets, hardware, and the like, and receiving in return cotton and other produce of the country. In the panic of 1798, he became financially embarrassed, but, true to his manly nature, he worked steadily on till every dollar was paid. He sold 25,000 acres of his wild land, sold his home, and moved into a log house at the Hermitage, seven miles out of Nashville, and preserved for himself the best thing on earth, a good name. So honest was he believed to be, when a Tennessean went to Boston Bankers for a loan, with several leading names on his paper, they said, Do you know General Jackson? Could you get his endorsement? Yes, but he is not worth a tenth as much as either of these men whose names I offer you, was the response. No matter, General Jackson has always protected himself and his paper, and will let you have the money on the strength of his name. And the loan was granted. Honest and just though he was, he permitted his own fiery nature, or a perverted public opinion, to lead him into acts which tarnished his whole subsequent career. Quick to resent a wrong, he was morbidly sensitive about the circumstances of his marriage with Rachel Robards. When they were married, in 1791, they supposed that the divorce applied for had been granted, but they learned in 1793, two years afterward, that it was not legally obtained till the latter date. They were at once remarried, but the matter caused much idle talk, and, as General Jackson came into prominence, his enemies were not slow to rehearse the story. The slightest aspiration of his wife's character aroused all the anger of his nature, and, says Parton, for the man who dared breathe her name except an honor, he kept pistols in perfect condition for thirty-seven years. And, as dueling was the disgraceful fashion of the times, Jackson did not hesitate to use his pistols. In 1806, when he was thirty-nine, one of those miscalled affairs of honor took place. Charles Dickinson, a prominent man of the state, in the course of a long quarrel, had spoken disparagingly of Mrs. Jackson, and he was therefore challenged to mortal combat. Thursday morning, May 29th, he kissed his young wife tenderly, telling her he was going to Kentucky, and would be home, sure, tomorrow night. He met Jackson on the banks of the Red River. The one was tall, erect, and intense. The other, young, handsome, an expert marksman, and determined to make no mistake in his fatal work. Dickinson fired with his supposed unerring aim, and missed. The bullet grazed Jackson's breast, and years later was the true cause of his death. Jackson took deliberate aim, intending to kill his opponent, and succeeded. The ball passed quite through Dickinson's body. His wife was sent for, being told that he was dangerously wounded. On her way thither she met, in a rough emigrant wagon, the body of her husband. He had come home sure tomorrow night, but dead. He was deeply mourned by the state, which sympathized with his wife and infant child. General Jackson made bitter enemies by this act. Rachel had been avenged, but at what a fearful cost! Eighteen years had gone by since Jackson's marriage. He had received distinguished honors. He had been a representative, a senator, a judge of the Supreme Court of the State, a major general of the militia, 
but one joy was wanting. No children had been born in the home. Mrs. Jackson's nephews and nieces were often at the hermitage, and he made her kindred his own. But both loved children, and this one blessing was denied them. In 1809, twins were born to Mrs. Jackson's brother. One of these, when but a few days old, was taken to the hermitage, and the general adopted him, giving him his own name, Andrew Jackson. Even after, this child was a comfort and a delight. Visitors would often find the general reading, with the boy in the rocking chair beside him or in his lap. Honorable Thomas H. Benton, in his Thirty Years' View, tells this story. I arrived at his house one wet chilly evening in February, and came upon him in the twilight, sitting alone before the fire, a lamb and a child between his knees. He started a little, called a servant to remove the two innocents to another room, and explained to me how it was. The child had cried because the lamb was out in the cold, and begged him to bring it in, which he had done to please the child, his adopted son, then not two years old. The ferocious man does not do that, and though Jackson had his passions and his violence, they were for men and enemies, those who stood up against him, and not for women and children, or the weak and helpless, for all whom his feelings were those of protection and support. Jackson was always the friend of young men, a constant inspiration to them to do their best. He knew the possibilities of a barefooted boy like himself. The world owes thanks to those who are its inspiration, whose minds develop ours, whose sweetness of nature makes us grow lovable, as plants grow in the sunshine, whose ideals become our ideals, who lead us up the mountains of faith and trust and hope. But the cord is silken, and we never know that we are led. We go through life loving and serving, for love is service. Who are our comfort and strength? We lean on those whom we love. While Jackson was the friend of young men, especially he was loyal to any who were near his heart. He was like another great man in a great war, the hero of 1812 and the hero of 1861. Jackson and Grant were true to those who had been true to them. Only a man of small soul forgets the ladder by which he climbs. The second war with Great Britain had come upon the American people, June 19, 1812. Our country had suffered in its commerce through the continued wars of England with France. Vessels had been searched by the English to find persons suspected of being British subjects. Often American seamen were impressed into their service. On the ocean, the contest between English and American ships became almost constant. While a portion of the states were not in favor of the war, one person was surely in favor and ready for it, one who had not forgotten the death of his mother and brothers in the Revolutionary War, who had not forgotten the wounds on his head and hand. That person was General Jackson. He at once offered to the governor of Louisiana, for the defense of New Orleans, 3,000 soldiers. The offer was accepted, and he started for Natchez, there to await orders. The men were in the best of spirits, kept hopeful and enthusiastic by the ardor of their commander, who said to them, Perish our friends, perish our wives, perish our children, the dearest pledges of heaven, nay, perish all earthly considerations, but let the honor and fame of a volunteer soldier be untarnished and immaculate. We now enjoy liberties, political, civil, and religious, that no other nation on earth possesses. May we never survive them. No, rather let us perish in maintaining them. And if we must yield, where is the man that would not prefer being buried in the ruins of his country than live the ignominious slave of haughty lords and unfeeling tyrants? After a time the orders came, but what was the astonishment and indignation of both officers and men to hear that their services were not needed, as the British evidently did not intend to attack New Orleans, that they were to disband and return to Tennessee, without pay or rations, five hundred miles from home. Jackson felt that it was an insult. He took an oath that they should never disband till they were at their own doors, that he would conduct his brave three thousand through the wilderness and the Indian tribes and be responsible for expenses. One hundred and fifty of his men were ill. He put those who could ride on horses, and then, walking at their head, led the gallant company toward home. The soldiers used to say that he was tough as hickory, then old hickory grew to be a term of endearment which he bore ever afterward a month later and the disappointed soldiers were at nashville 
before they disbanded they were marched out upon the public square and received a superb stand of colors the needlework was on white satin eighteen orange stars in a crescent with two sprigs of laurel and the words tennessee volunteers independence in a state of war is to be maintained on the battleground of the republic the tented field is the post of honor presented by the ladies of east tennessee under these words were all the implements of war cannons muskets drums swords and the like jackson and his men never forgot this offering of love and showed themselves worthy of it in after years if Jackson was not needed at New Orleans, he was soon needed elsewhere. Tecumseh, the great Indian chief, saw the lands of his fathers passing into the hands of the white men. He had long been uniting the western tribes from Florida to the northern lakes, and now that we were at war with England, he believed the hour of their delivery was come. He at once incited the creeks of Alabama to arms. In the southern portion of that state, forty miles north of Mobile, stood Fort Mims. The whites had become alarmed at the hostile attitude of the Indians, and over five hundred men, women, and children had crowded into the fort for safety. On the 30th of August, 1813, a thousand Creek warriors, in their war paint and feathers, uttering their terrible war whoops, rushed into the fort, tomahawked the men and women, and trampled the children into the dust. The buildings were burned, and the plain was covered with dead bodies. The massacre at Fort Mims blanched every face and embittered every heart the Tennesseans offered at once to march against the Creeks. The hot-headed General Jackson had been wounded in a quarrel with Thomas H. Benton, and was suffering from the ball in his shoulder, which he carried there for twenty years. But he put his left arm into a sling, and though emaciated through long weeks of illness, he led his twenty-five hundred men into the Indians' country. The provisions did not follow them as had been arranged. Jackson wrote home earnestly for money and food. He said, there is an enemy whom I dread much more than I do the hostile Creeks, and whose power I am fearful I shall first be made to feel. I mean the meager monster Famine. And yet he encouraged his men with these brave words. Shall an enemy wholly unacquainted with military evolution, and who rely more for victory on their grim visages and hideous yells than upon their bravery or their weapons, shall such an enemy ever drive before them the well-trained youths of our country, whose bosoms pant for glory and a desire to avenge the wrongs they have received. Your general will not live to behold such a spectacle. Rather would he rush into the thickest of the enemy and submit himself to their scalping knives. With his soldiers he will face all dangers, and with them participate in the glory of conquest. The first battle with the Creeks was fought under General John Coffey at Tullus Chatches, thirteen miles from Jackson's camp, the friendly Creeks leading the way, wearing white feathers and white deer tails to distinguish them from the hostile tribes. The whites, maddened by the memory of Fort Mims, fought like tigers. The Indians, sullen and revengeful at the prospect of losing their homes and their hunting grounds, neither asked nor gave quarter, and fought heroically. Nearly the whole town perished. On the battlefield was found a dead mother with her arms clasped about a living child. The babe was brought into camp, and Jackson asked some of the Indian women to care for it. No, said they, all his relations are dead. Kill him too. The baby was cared for at General Jackson's expense till the campaign was over and then carried to the hermitage, where he grew to young manhood as a petted son. The general and his wife gave him the name of Link Coyer. In his seventeenth year he died of consumption, sincerely mourned by his devoted friends. Following the battle of Tellus Chatches, General Jackson moved against Talladega, and, after a bloody conflict, rescued one hundred and fifty friendly Creeks. Returning to camp, he found starvation staring him in the face. The men were becoming desperate, yet he kept his cheerfulness, dividing with them the last crust. One morning a gaunt, hungry-looking soldier approached General Jackson as he was sitting under a tree, eating, and asked for some food, saying that he was nearly starving. It has been a rule with me, said the general, never to turn away a hungry man, when it is in my power to relieve him, and I will most cheerfully divide with you what I have. Putting his hand in his pocket, he drew forth a few acorns. This is the best and only fare I have, he said, and the soldier was comforted. Many of the men had enlisted for three months only, and were impatient to return home. Finally, the militia determined to return with or without the general's consent. 
Jackson heard of their intention, and at once ordered the volunteers to detain them, peaceably if they could, forcibly if they must. Then the volunteers in turn attempted to go back, but were met by Jackson's firm resolve to shoot the first man who took a step toward home. I cannot, he said, must not believe that the volunteers of Tennessee, a name ever dear to fame, will disgrace themselves, and a country which they have honored, by abandoning her standard as mutineers and deserters. But should I be disappointed and compelled to resign this pleasing hope, one thing I will not resign, my duty. Mutiny and sedition, so long as I possess the power of quelling them, shall be put down, and even when left destitute of this, I will still be found in the last extremity endeavoring to discharge the duty I owe my country and myself. That one word, duty, was the keynote of Jackson's life. It was his religion. It was his philosophy. With all Jackson's kindness to his men, they knew that he could be severe. John Woods, a boy not eighteen, the support of aged parents, was shot for refusing to obey a superior officer. That he could have been spared seems probable, but Jackson taught hard lessons to his undisciplined troops, and sometimes in a harsh manner. In seven months the Creeks had been utterly routed. Half their warriors were dead, and the rest were broken in spirit. Weathersford, their most heroic chief, the leader at the Fort Mims massacre, sought General Jackson at his camp. How dare you, said Jackson, right up to my tent, after having murdered the women and children at Fort Mims. General Jackson, I am not afraid of you, was the reply. I fear no man, for I am a Creek warrior. I have nothing to request in behalf of myself. You can kill me if you desire, but I come to beg you to send for the women and children of the war party who are now starving in the woods. Their fields and cribs have been destroyed by your people, who have driven them to the woods without an ear of corn. I hope that you will send out parties who will conduct them safely here in order that they may be fed. I exerted myself in vain to prevent the massacre of the women and children at Fort Mims. I am now done fighting. The red sticks are nearly all killed. If I could fight you any longer, I would most heartily do so. Send for the women and children. They never did you any harm, but kill me if the white people want it done. Kill him, kill him, shouted several voices. Silence! exclaimed Jackson. Any man who would kill as brave a man as this would rob the dead. Weathersford's request was granted, and the women and children of the war party were provided for. The chief died many years afterward, a planter in Alabama, respected by the Americans for his bravery and his honor. End of chapter 5, part 1